Hello, and welcome to week number seven in our series of professional development workshops for the 2020 Leadership Alliance Summer Programming. I'm Dr. Will Whittles. I am the manager for undergraduate and graduate programs here at the Leadership Alliance. I will be the moderator for today's event. This event is a component of the Leadership Alliance Virtual Professional Development Program. Leadership Alliance partners created this initiative to ensure continuity of skill building, networking, and exposure to graduate programs for students from across the country. Paired with our Monday evening Conversations with a Doctoral Scholar series, we hope to provide you with a platform for discussion of critical issues, networking with each other and our wonderful doctoral scholars, as well as for learning approaches and skills for navigating your research careers. This series would not be possible without the work of my colleagues at Brown University, Chaminade University in Honolulu, Weill Cornell Medical College, and Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. To those colleagues, thank you for your efforts in creating this program. Today we'll be talking about how to give a lightning talk. In today's digital, today's digital and network-centric age lends itself well to rapid, clear sharing of information about research. Knowing how to share your research in this way will expand your communication toolbox and perhaps even shake a few ideas loose in your research. We're joined by two members of the Leadership Alliance family who are experts in giving a lightning talk and have the hardware to prove it, both having won 3MT or three minute thesis competitions for their graduate work. First, we have Dr. Bailey Brown, uh, Bailey Brown completed her PhD in sociology from Columbia University. At Columbia, Dr. Brown previously earned an MPhil and MA and was named Paul S. Lazarsfeld Fellow and a Ford Foundation Predoctoral Fellow. Dr. Brown holds a bachelor's degree in sociology with minors in urban education and Africana studies from the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Brown was a Ronald E. McNair Scholar a Leadership Alliance Fellow, and received top departmental honors for her senior thesis at Penn. For the 2020-2021 academic year, Dr. Brown will join the Department of Sociology at Princeton University as a Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow. Dr. Brown will join the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Spelman College as an Assistant Professor of Sociology in the fall of 2021. Dr. Brown researches and teaches on urban sociology, race and ethnicity, and education. Jamal al Qaeda uh, is a computational PhD candidate at Weill Cornell Medicine in the lab of Dr. Olivier Elemento. A recipient of the NIH's F31 Fellowship, Jamal's research focuses on applying machine learning and other computational techniques to traditional drug development. He was co-president of the Tri-Institutional Minority Society from 2016 to 2018 and winner of the 2018 three-minute thesis competition for Weill Cornell Graduate School and the Gerstner Sloan Kettering Graduate School. So today we're going to begin by hearing the lightning talks of both of our guest scholars. We're going to start with Dr. Brown. Let me bring up your slide very quickly. Um, and then I will share my screen. Dr. Brown, take it away. Okay, great, thank you. So I'd like to pose a question to you all. When was the last time you were uncertain about something? As a teen, maybe it was waiting to hear about your college application, and now maybe it's waiting to hear about a job offer or deciding whether you should move to a new city. So we all face countless decisions through life and can probably admit to feeling uncertain for some of these big decisions. But now I'd like to set a new scene for you. Imagine that you're a parent and your child is three. At the daycare, you overhear parents talking about pre-kindergarten and you begin to think to yourself, am I already behind? How will I make this decision, you might wonder. In my research on parents, I use the phrase kindergarten panic or kinder panic for short to describe this moment of uncertainty. I argue that this feeling is linked to increases in public school options over the last few decades. Today, two out of every five parents has a public school option available to them. 
These options include district transfers, magnet schools, and charter schools. So these school options offer more choices, but they also place more responsibility on parents to make decisions. And to investigate this new responsibility, I interviewed 100 low-income and middle-income parents from diverse backgrounds in New York City. The interviews I conducted focused on parents' experiences applying to elementary schools. I then systematically coded these interviews, and I immediately identified repeated trends of stress and anxiety. I found that parents struggled in three main areas, managing applications, understanding school admissions policies, and interpreting complex school data. So why should we care about the decisions parents make for their children? Well, for one, we all face decisions and we have all felt how difficult some decisions can be. And more broadly, the decisions parents make can have long-term social consequences. Public schools of choice are expanding across New York City, the site of my research, and across the United States. And the decisions parents make in elementary school can shape how students are tracked in middle school, high school, and college. Beyond education, these findings shed light on decision-making as an important area of inequality. We tend to think of wealth and income as the most intuitive measures of inequality. But through the concept of kinder panic, I demonstrate how inequality is also experienced in the everyday decisions people have to make. So when low-income parents have to invest more energy in everyday decisions like choosing a public school, this can perpetuate disparities between the rich and the poor. So the next time you have to make a decision, think about kinder panic and think about the way decision making for elementary schools and surely a host of other circumstances may result in unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Jamal. Take it away at your convenience. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, as you guys know, uh, this is known as a three minute thesis, so probably less time than the ads on Hulu that you were watching yesterday. <laughs> um, but let's actually take a trip back to the 1990s. Imagine that you're a middle-aged male and that you've just been diagnosed with heart disease. Concerned, you ask your doctors what options there are for you, and they proceed to tell you of a clinical trial going on that they believe you'd be the perfect candidate for. So you go and speak to those doctors and they agree. So they start you on a trial of their drug, sildenafil. Now, after a few weeks, you go back to speak to these doctors and they proceed to ask if you've noticed any side effects since taking the drug. Blushing, you mention one rather specific side effect, lasting for no longer than four hours, of course. Sildenafil is more commonly known as Viagra today. Viagra is the perfect example of drug repositioning. That is, being able to take a drug originally intended to treat one disease and using it to treat another. Viagra, originally intended to treat heart disease, is now known to treat, well, you know. But why should we care about drug repositioning? Currently, it costs about $2.6 billion and takes about 15 years to get a drug all the way from the small molecule stage to market. Throughout this timeline, there are so many opportunities for a drug to fail that we don't want to waste time and resources testing drugs on random diseases, hoping to find that needle in a haystack. This is where we come in. Through my work in the lab of Dr. Olivier Elemento, we have been able to successfully come up with a computational method that is able to predict what diseases a drug is able to treat. But how are we able to do this? I believe that our, that our method could best be compared to America's favorite pastime, Netflix. Now, whenever you finish watching a television show on Netflix, you will be taken to a screen similar to this one, though with a different profile picture, I hope. The service will then suggest other shows you might like based on characteristics of the one you just watched. Because you watched a show with a strong female lead, you might like Wonder Woman. Because you watched a show about nothing, you might also like Friends. So let's apply it. There's a common expression. If it looks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. But in the drug universe, if it's structurally similar to a drug that treats prostate cancer and has the same side effects as a drug that treats prostate cancer and has the same targets as a drug that treats prostate cancer, then your drug could probably also treat prostate cancer. Through our work, we have been able to prove that drugs that treat the same disease do in fact share these characteristics and more. So overall, we can take our initial drug in question, see which other drugs it is highly similar to, see what diseases these highly similar drugs treat, and be able to predict a disease for our initial drug. And our method works. We have been able to prove success with our method. But we don't just want to stop there. 
we want to take this one step further and be able to make predictions on drugs where little information is, is known about them to aid with drug discovery efforts. So the next time you hear that you're a great candidate for a clinical trial, please don't be afraid to join. But please make sure to check in with your doctor if you're experiencing any side effects lasting for longer than four hours, no matter how pleasant they may be. Thank you. Thank you both. That was awesome. Um, so I wanted to start, and we can start with Bailey and then go to Jamal. Um, can you walk us through the process of condensing and, and shaping your really awesome research into an equally awesome but much more compact um, package? Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So our 3MT competition, just for some context at Columbia, it was run through career services and they saw it as this professional development opportunity for doctoral students. So immediately upon like trying to enter the competition, I had to think about how someone who was from a very different field of work would um, be drawn to my topic. And I learned that like the phrase that really caught their attention was kinder panic or kindergarten panic. And that's just one idea from my dissertation. Um, but they said that it would be really helpful if I kind of talked about that concept and made it relatable um, to the people that I was presenting to. And they said, like, how about you pose different questions to the audience and then walk us through your methods and then um, show us how you came to kind of these different conclusions. Um, so I sort of started with like the, the biggest um, uh, kind of catchphrase of my dissertation or coined term that I could then talk about to the audience. And that's how I uh, developed the, the presentation. But um, it's actually only one chapter of my dissertation. Um, yeah, to kind of echo what Bailey was saying, it's like, yeah, I was basically trying to figure out when I, what I, how I approached it was kind of trying to figure out how, when I'm trying to explain to my parents what I do, how am I able to kind of get those ideas across or the main ideas across? What catches their attention exactly? Yeah. Um, and then the idea is like, when you catch their attention, how do you keep their attention? Um, and in my mind, I always enjoy when people try to interject a little humor in their talks, um, which is why, as you can tell, we gave two wonderful talks, but kind of like different in tonality and everything like that, which are excellent for completely different reasons, which is, I loved your talk, Bailey. <laughs> I liked yours too, so I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so yeah, my method was kind of exactly trying to explain how do I explain what I do to others who might not be in the field at all, but still get the, the main message across? Uh, we'll stay with you, Jamal, and then go to, to Bailey. What was the hardest part of formulating this talk? I think the hardest part for me was coming up with the perfect analogy. Um, so what I found is that like science is, I mean, sci every field is difficult, but I feel like science, you can get caught up with a lot of te technical jargon. Um, so notice in my talk, I didn't even use the phrase machine learning because then I'd have to talk about what machine learning is and things like that. So it was kind of trying to figure out the best way to say what I do in the most simplistic terms. Um, and it's got to, and I tried to figure out a way that something that everyone could relate to, um, which is how I can't, luckily I was able to come up with a Netflix analogy because it seems, especially in today's times, it seems that a lot of people are stuck to their televisions and Netflix is a big streaming service out there. So I feel very fortunate that I was able to come up with this sort of analogy and be able to roll with that. Yeah, um, I think for me, it was like two different, um, two different uh, challenges. Like the first was more logistical, like just like memorizing the whole talk because you can't go with notes. And like even at conference presentations, you sort of have like some notes in front of you or multiple slides. So like really just trying to memorize it and putting everything, designing the slide and putting everything on there. And then I think conceptually, it was really hard to, to like, because I, I felt like I was leaving so much out and that I wanted to say more. And I was like, well, what if someone comes to my talk and they're like, you didn't mention this important piece of the literature and this author on sociology of education. And I was like, oh no, that would be terrible. But I mean, of course it's a lightning talk, but you still worry that you're, that you're gonna lose something. So I think instead I positioned it and framed it like this is just one aspect that I'm talking about. Um, and this is why it's important. So I think that was like kind of a struggle too. Keep you on the hot seat, Bailey. If you were to offer one piece of advice for uh, a student developing a, a 3MT or a lightning talk, what would it be? Uh, one piece of advice. 
I think watching other people's talks um, is really helpful for generating ideas about how you want to structure it and like looking at similarities across the talks and differences and thinking about like your own style through it. So you've already been able to see too. Um, and if you go on the 3MT website, you can see even more talks in a variety of fields. So I think that would be my best like starting point. It's like, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can see what's been done in the past and, and use that to model your own. Um, I think to add on to that, I think the other piece of advice I would give would be to practice it. You kind of want to get to the point where it just kind of flows out of you. And even if you like start to like think away during the talk, you're, the words are still coming out in the right order and you don't really have anything to worry about. That being said, you shouldn't like zone out during your talk. <laughs> but the more you speak it, the more comfortable you will get in it. And if you happen to see a clock, um, which may or may not stress you out, but you can adjust your speed accordingly because you know it so well by heart. You can talk faster if you need to, or you can talk slower if you need to because you're going too fast. I myself am a fast talker, so I had to like practice slowing down essentially my talk when I saw how fast I was going. Um, so, but it's just keep practicing, like practice in the shower, practice while you're walking. You just sound like a person muttering to yourself, but that's fine. Um, if you were, and we'll keep you on the hot seat, Jamal. Um, if you were to do the process all over again, what would you change about your lightning talk or how would you approach it differently? Oh, uh, I've never been asked that question. That's an interesting question. Um, I think, oh, <laughs> apologies. It's taking a second to think about. Um, I think if I were to do it again, um, I think I would, I think I would try practicing in front of people and actually getting live feedback um, because I was all in my head and I would be like, oh, this makes sense or this doesn't make sense. Um, I see I'm reiterating the importance of practicing, but I do think like having and, and like uh, being able to do it kind of get it kind of done like a little bit ahead of time so that you don't have to, you're not changing it the day before and worrying about which version you're doing, but kind of getting it so it's just ingrained in your head. So I think I would practice in front of people to get live feedback. Um, people whose opinions I trusted, obviously, um, both in the scientific community or the non-scientific community, depending on who the audience is that you're looking for. Do you want Bailey, me? if you, yeah, if you could. Okay, yeah, yeah. say the question one more time. I was like answering the questions in the chat and I was like getting myself distracted. <laughs> if you could, um, if you had to do it again, if you had to do, yeah. give this talk again, how would you do it differently? Would you approach it, the preparation um, process differently? Would you change the talk? Yeah. Um, I could do it differently maybe like uh I think it would have been different so this chapter looks really different in my dissertation I focused just on mothers and 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 like the gender inequality in the school decision making and I think that's really important and it doesn't come out in the in the talk right now like the way it stands um so that's like some, another component that I would add that I think would make it stronger um and yeah, I, th I think that's pretty much what I would change. I, I feel like I, I practiced a lot. Um, yeah, I think that's what I would change. More of like the content, I would say. So um, thanks for indulging my questions. I'm going to turn to student questions now. We uh, received one for each of you um, before this started, and then we'll go to the ones that we're getting in live. So um, the first one is for um, you, Bailey. With okay. the knowledge you've acquired throughout your substantial academic formation, especially with your minor in Africana studies, what's your future prognostic for the Black Lives Matter movement? Uh, and in your opinion, the best ways to further amplify its relevance to our society. This is a little bit, this is not exactly on lightning talks, but <laughs> no, it's um, not. we're talking about amplifying <laughs> messages. So I guess okay. just there. Um. Okay, so what's like, how do I predict the best way to amplify the message, like as an academic or like just the movement in, its, in and of itself? Um, I think the, the, the movement in and of itself, I think that's my understanding of the question. Wow, okay. Um, I don't know. So even though I was, I, I did minor in Africana studies, my, my research and my work focuses a lot on education, but I can actually talk about like how I've approached the Black Lives Matter movement in my teaching and with students, especially because I was teaching a class as 
protests were happening across the country and specifically in New York City. And so one way that um, I think it's important is to understand how that it's not just sort of police systems that um, we need to, to think about as, as these protests are happening and as we're trying to create these changes, but we also need to think about education systems and the way that education systems perpetuate inequality. And if we can understand you know, that as part of the issue and, and, the, and like the, the different levels of education that students receive across the country, I think that can also help us to amplify this issue. Um, so we all go to, we all may go to schools um, or have some sort of education um, in the K through 12 level, but they, they vary a lot. And um, we need to think about what that means in the long term and what kind of opportunities or disadvantages it structures for communities. Um, so that's how I approach it in teaching and, and when helping students kind of think through um, think through like the Black Lives Matter movement, different protests that are happening around um, police violence. Uh, and I think it, it could also be a way to amplify the issue. But more specifically, I think that um, social media has been an amazing tool, especially like you were saying in this digital age to help us think about, to help amplify different issues and to spread information really quickly. I think I've learned so much um, not through being able to physically see and be with anyone or hear from anyone, but through um, the social media feeds of my colleagues and friends. Jamal, uh, the, the question that came in for you beforehand was, what is the most relevant aspect you choose to highlight from your research on drug repositioning, applying machine learning amongst other computational, computational techniques, when presenting it to other research field peers? I don't have a question about social movements. But, um, <laughs> I, was, I, was, uh, I was just bracing myself for something related to Corona. <laughs> so I apologize, could you it, it, my conviction is to try and honor the, the questions from the students as much as possible. Um, what is the most relevant aspect you choose to highlight from your research on drug repositioning um, when presenting it to other research field peers? Sure, yeah. Um, so I think that it's kind of that to answer that would kind of be um, it's kind of wondering what are the questions that I'm looking to like why am I doing my research what are the questions I'm looking to answer but also it, when I go to hear other scientific talks or other talks it doesn't have to be scientific but it's kind of like if I see the title of a talk you don't really you kind of get an idea of what they're going to talk about but they're kind of like immediate questions that pop into your mind um just straight off the bat like what is this topic going to be about or like are they going to talk about this maybe slightly related thing so it's kind of like figuring out what that sort of list of questions would be and what's the best way to kind of address the list of questions in the most succinct manner that could you know cross off multiple questions at the same time um, because the, i mean the field of drug repositioning is a gigantic field i touched on just a small portion of it um, so yeah i think just trying to figure out the best way to convey the questions that i personally would also want answered i hope that answered the question if not please Write it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, same for me. If you want, if I didn't really answer your question, let me know and I can try. So the, 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 the question we have at the top of the queue in the chat is, um, uh, one of my biggest struggles in short presentations is knowing how and when to define key terms. Um, so the, I'm interested in queer studies, for example. If presenting to a lay audience, I often need to define the word queer and other relevant terms. Do you have advice on how to do this um, without cutting too far into the actual presentation? Oh, sure. Um, so I was just thinking about like the term that I use, like kindergarten panic or kinder panic, which isn't really like a, um, like it's, you know, like I came up with the definition for it. So of course I have to say it and then like define it. Um, but I did that in one sentence and then like, um, and then in that one sentence went jumped from there to, to then other parts of, of my research. So I think that you cannot cut too far into it by just um, devoting like one sentence to defining it and then um, giving analogies or giving examples of how it relates to the rest of your talk. But it's okay, I think, in these lightning talks to give definitions and to make terms clear for the, pe for the audience members. Jamal. I was like, should I add to that? Um, yeah, I think I agree. 
Um, especially if you're doing something like a, an analogy, usually about immediately after the analogy, you're going to want to define the terms that they're going to get used to hearing. Um, and I agree, just define them right away. They are a part of your research. You are, you are happy to use those terms. You want everyone else to know what the terms are. Um, but if the dictionary can define them in pretty succinct terms in like a sentence or two, you also can define them in like a sentence or two. Um, of course, like in, in I, I saw another question further down that I'm going to try to weave in here, but it was like a question about avoiding jargon, which is definitely something that would happen here, um, especially on important concepts. And sometimes there's gonna be some jargon that you can't avoid. Like maybe it's a specific gen, gene name. Um, for example, something like DNA helicase, um, which for those of you who don't know, DNA helicase, the best way to think of it is like, it unzips your, it unzips your genes, and unzips your genetic information. Um, but being able to put that kind of in a very succinct answer, a succinct analogy that people can understand right away, you just need to hook them so they kind of get the surface level of it. Um, maybe not, I mean, if they want to have a more in-depth conversation with you, they'll follow up with you. Um, but kind of, but being able to just quickly tell them essentially enough information that they need to know to understand the rest of the talk. Don't get yourself hung up on all the technical jargon because you will get hung up on that and you could probably spend the whole three minutes just defining terms. I'm gonna keep you on the hot seat. What do you do to overcome public speaking nerves? Huh, yes, this is, this is a great question. Um, I think practicing is one of the biggest things I could say, as I mentioned before, kind of just being able to just spit it out without kind of thinking about it. Of course, it's a bit unnerving when you are speaking in front of like a large crowd of people um, and you just see them all staring at you. Um, so one thing that I would definitely recommend is being able to kind of focus on yourself um, and it, whether, I know there's like techniques out there, like imagine them in their underwear or something like that. Um, I personally don't like that one. I think that's distracting. Um, but if, if you are speaking to an audience, maybe if you could, if you need to like focus your gaze for a second, focus on a spot that's not a person oriented spot, whether it be a light or something like that. And just take a minute, breathe to yourself. Since you've practiced before, you know you can do this. And this is just another iteration of that. And don't get me wrong, public speaking is nerve wracking. Um, even like before this, I was like, oh no, like, am I going to be okay? But just, I just had to like, once again, like breathe, run it through my like head one more time, say, okay, I can do this. Then what happens, happens. Yeah. Um, I was just going to add, like, sometimes, you know, you want to try to make it seem like you're making eye contact, but if you're standing in front of an audience, you can like look um, in between like the heads of people and it looks, and instead of looking someone directly in the eyes, like, I think that when you're giving a talk and you look someone in the eyes in the eyes and they don't look interested that gets me down and then i'm like oh why am i giving this talk but i think if you look in between um it can still look like you're making eye contact but then you won't get nervous um so that's one way and practice definitely so uh the next question is is, is again about preparing um, is there a, a guide or a set of questions to follow for putting one of these together? Or, and I'll expand on this question. Are there, are there resources that you want to point um, our students to? Mm -hmm. Bailey. Yeah, so this relates to one of the questions I answered about um, about where to go to find the, the, the tapings. So that's the same place you can go to find um, to, like sort of tutorials or guides. So if you type in 3MT in Google search, it should bring you to the 3MT website, which is actually like international. I think it's like run out of like New Zealand or something like that, but they have instructions um, and hints and like some slides and PDFs about like how to think about it, how to go through the steps of forming your talk. And I found that to be really helpful. So like a lot of the techniques we use, like posing questions, giving examples, making analogies, telling a story, those are all like sort of suggestions they'll give in, in the guide when you search it. Um, so that, those are some resources you can use. And I think I sent like this, um, a slide to someone that this, that anyone is who needs to give a lightning talk is free to look at. It's called a research pitch, but you can still think of it. Um, it could still be helpful to you in the lightning talk. Um, it, we'll make sure that gets posted in the Google Classroom if it okay. hasn't already. Um, awesome. So yeah, thank you for that. Jamal. I used the exact same resources. I think to add on, um, if you YouTube, uh, go on YouTube and watch different talks, I mean, YouTube does have number of views for a reason. So you could go on and see which ones are the most viewed talks and then see why are they the most viewed talks. Whether you agree or disagree is your opinion entirely. 
but you can see what did tend to captivate the audience or even the online viewers. Um, but other than that, I used the exact same resources that Bailey did. <laughs> In using those resources and deciding what to present, how did you choose which topics are important for the lightning talk? Um, given that research, you know, it's, it's a bigger comprehensive thing. How did you pick um, which, which topic you were going to present, which topic of your research you were going to present? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Um, I'll go first. Sorry, Bailey, if I interrupted no, you. No, 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 go ahead. That's perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that um, the way to do that, I th what I would personally do is either go from the like, bottom up or the top down. I think what I did is I went from the top down where I was like, okay, my, if I had to like describe my thesis in two words, I would say like drug repositioning. And I said, okay, what aspect of drug repositioning do I want to tell them about? And then I go down a level and I say, okay, I want to talk about, you know, how similar drugs are to each other and then diseases. And then basically from that, you can sort of start outlining the talk in your head. And then if you kind of like think about yourself, how long will it take me to kind of introduce drug repositioning, then switch over to how long will it take me? You realize that you can get to three minutes very quickly. And then, so your question, the question is, do you want to like really go much more vertical and like barely touch on anything, but like go very deep into it? Or do you want to stay more surface level, but kind of cover more ground? Um, and both are excellent in different ways. Um, but I'd recommend just like kind of figuring out how to like outline the topics to get to the, to get to the point that you want to get to. I, I think that's a, I think that's a great point. And I, I think another way to look at it, if, if there are like multiple, like distinct ideas, like it could be the idea that you think is the strongest at that particular moment. Like that's what it was for me. Like this idea was the strongest. It was coming out of my interviews repeatedly and I knew I could talk about it. Whereas other chapters, I just, I wasn't even, I think I was like in my second to last or third to last year in the program. So I still like had a lot more analyzing to do but this was the one idea that I felt like confident I could talk about. Um, so it was also like sort of a timing thing too. And I think that's okay. Like, you know, research is an evolving ongoing process. So it's okay to talk about what is strongest in that moment. Um, along with that, the next question is about facts and figures. So how do you decide which facts and figures need to be in your slide and which ones don't? Um, Bailey, you can start. Yeah, so they like, uh, we got some help on this. So like the, this was like the third version or fourth version of the slide um, that I had. And I think um, because you can only have one slide for this competition, you have to use the space wisely. And they suggest like having more images versus text. Um, and so they suggested that I should have like some like statistics that show um, why this is important and then that the flow of my slide should follow the flow that I kind of speak about each issue. So I, the first kind of thing I talk about is that this affects every two and five parents. Um, and then I think the next um, piece on there might have been about how many parents I interviewed, which is what I talk about next. And then the three things where they struggled and then my key concept is in the bottom. So there's a way that sort of your eye moves along the slide. and um, I got feedback that I should like follow that order. And then the background is kind of like someone trying to decide what path to take, which is sort of like the underlying idea of uncertainty. Um, but sometimes, especially like for like, if you're in English or like humanities, it may not look like that at all. Like it may be more like the actual archival text that you're, that you're, I'm looking at or like if it's a film like a screenshot of that film so they can take really different forms Jamal? yeah I would a hundred percent agree with what Bailey was saying um, I think the other thing is that um, it's kind of up to you with how you want to utilize the slide um, I myself in one of the preliminary so when I approached it I essentially wanted to give a presentation where it didn't really matter if you looked at the slide or not um, because I know people's attentions would wave and that is an approach to 3MT. It is not necessarily the approach a lot of people use, um, but that is the approach that I want to do. So in one of my prelim rounds, they actually commented that I didn't use my slide and I should figure out a way to actually incorporate my slide because that is, you know, a resource given to me. Um, that being said, I've seen a lot of scientific talks where if they want to show like the significance of how much like their product has improved or their method has improved, they will show a figure like literally showing as Bailey was saying, like the statistical significance. Um, 
in my mind, the point that I wanted to get across wasn't necessarily how much better our method was, but that our method was better. So, was, so in my mind, I was able to talk about the kind of the method in its entirety rather than focus on that. But it depends on kind of what you're trying to get across. Um, but definitely images over text, um, especially as you could tell, both of our slides did not have much text at all. You don't want people, you want people listening to you. You, want, you don't want them distracted reading a bunch of terms on your slide. How do you utilize nonverbal communication in making an effective presentation? So stay with you, Jamal, on this one. Yeah, um, I think that's a. I think it's a very interesting question, and I think you need to base it off of. Wow, I even looked down as I said that because I was unsure of the answer. That's exactly the type of thing you need to kind of see what in even different presentation. When you watch people present, it's kind of like what aspects of their presentation did you like? What aspects did you not like? Um, for example, one of the things that I really liked in I really like in presentations and is when people kind of vary the different like uh, how they how they speak with their voice. Their voice tends to vary rather than just like totally being monotonous. Um, because in my mind, that can get a little boring. So I when I give a presentation, I try to emulate that. Um, in terms of like nonverbalness, it's kind of like I mean, you will be giving a talk that about stuff you know, and you probably know that stuff better than most people there. Um, so you can be confident about your talk. Like this is a talk that you created from like from the little seed that is now your tree. Um, so it's kind of like you, I think with the nonverbal side, you need to figure out a way to embrace it for yourself, which is difficult. I, I say that it's easier said than done, trust me. But it's kind of like you can figure out a way. If you can, if you can be confident with yourself then other people will see that you're confident. Yeah, um, I think that's a good point. And I also thought about like when I gave this talk in front of people, I like moved around a little bit and pointed, like gestured to the pieces I was talking about on the slide, which is something we couldn't really do here, but I think that is a helpful technique. So to, in order to like use the slide, you can kind of point to where you are and then the audience is like with you and sort of engaged. Um, but yeah, the voice level changes, it's really important um, and movement is important. Those are sort of techniques I used. How does, uh giving a lightning talk differ from one that's presented to specialists in your field versus mm -hmm. ones that's presented to, you know, the, the, the public at large? Uh, yeah, so I, I thought of the, the lightning talk or the 3MT talk as something that had to be presented to an interdisciplinary audience. Um, so these were like other academics, but some people who weren't academics um, and not really that many people who were in sociology. Uh, so I think the, but then some people who were in sociology knew exactly what I was talking about. So I think that's what makes the lightning talk or the setting unique is that you kind of have to meet both people, kind of, both groups or audiences halfway. So you have to give enough um, background information that like the generalist understands what you're talking about. Um, but then at the same time, you know, it has to be accurate, it has to be rigorous, so that like someone who's in your field can also appreciate it. Uh, so I always thought of it as an, as presenting it to an interdisciplinary audience, as opposed to like, uh, like non scientists versus scientists, because um, there were a variety of people in the room, like, we also had to give it at the UN. And so like, these are people who are not, you know, they may not be researchers or scientists, but they're you know, they know like they're doing important and really big things too. So it's like, you know, you kind of have to, to think about it that way too. I think to add on to that, um, it's kind of going to be a different mentality approach. Um, so I actually gave my, my three minute thesis talk to um, people in my graduate program and the talk was quite a bit different. In fact, I didn't need to use analogies because kind of explaining analogies to them would be like saying the ABCs start with the letters A, B, and C. They're totally familiar with all the terms. So instead that one might not be analogy based. It would be more literally data driven focus. Like here is what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. And then here are the results from this. So I would, it's kind of less analogies and more here are the results, which is especially in a scientific field, that's what they want to hear about. Um, and then you might spend more time with why the results are meaningful instead of how we came to it instead of like why should we do the project if that makes sense more on the back end rather than the front end we're talking we're sort of using the terms lightning talk and 
3MT interchangeably. Um, a student is also asking about the difference between a lightning talk and a fast pitch or a fast research pitch. Could you differentiate between some of those things? I think I will defer to Bailey on this one since she's on the job market, actually. I think. You yeah. Yeah, this is a good question. So I would say that they're similar because they're both quick and you have a limited amount of time. So you're under time constraints for both. But a lightning talk is more sort of topical. So you're giving it to like a, you know, like a really broad audience where there may not be anybody in your field. Um, and, and it's about a particular topic and less about you. Whereas a research pitch is still is fast too and you're under a time constraint, but you're probably speaking, but you're speaking a little bit more about yourself. Um, and so this might be talking about the particular fields that you're in, what specific research you've done, what you've published, what you've produced. Um, and that's a research pitch. So like sort of like um, another way to call it is like an elevator pitch. It's something quick and you may, and you're, I think it's maybe you'd be more likely to speak to someone who know, who knows the field a little bit better. So it's more about you. Um, even though with the lightning talk, you're still talking about research that you've done. So besides analogies, what other tactics would you point out as important to keep the listener engaged? stick with you Bailey and then with Jamal. Okay yeah sure. Um, I think that like I really tried to like hone in on the inequality pieces so I tried to make it like relatable. So I posed these questions at the beginning that for the audience I was originally presenting to like they may say oh yeah that sounds familiar. So I, I kind of started with trying to make it relatable then talked about my project and then brought it back to like why we should care. Um, and, and so I think that's a technique to sort of pose questions to the audience that to get them thinking and to get them engaged. And then another strategy is to sort of tell a story. So I've seen a lot of 3MT talks where a person tells a story about how they got interested in this or where the idea for this research came from. And I think that's also an effective tool. I, I was just going to say, tell, like, make sure your talk tells a story. What are you trying to get across? And it can be a story where you start in one place and end in another place, and that's totally fine. Or it can be a circular story where it comes back exactly to the beginning. Um, and both are great, but you kind of, what is the message that you're trying to get across and how can you tell it in a story? I think that's advice. And it doesn't have to be analogies. Um, it's find what works for you. Like if this data gets you really excited, then it'll come across and you're like, look what we did. This is really exciting. <laughs> Um, and that's, that's even more exciting than an analogy. If we can see that you're excited about it, that's awesome. How do you prepare for an online versus an in-person talk? I think this is a great question. And I'm going to actually allude to something Bailey was saying earlier. So in my in-person three minute thesis talk, when I was practicing, uh, like a couple of days before I would practice like where I would walk and when I would point so that like I was, it was almost a bit robotic at that point. Um, in this one, clearly you could not do that. So it was more related. I needed to like look at my slide and say if there's any areas of the slide that I would need to kind of direct your attention to. Um, and if I have control of the mouse or something like that, that's totally great. If I don't, then I need to be able to interject if you look at the top right corner of your slide. Um, so I don't think it's too drastically different, but it's just uh, you need to figure out if, if any differences matter, how can you address this? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I have too much more to add. I, like, I think I would have thought about it like a little bit different differently if like this was online first. Um, like I would have tried to do more things like with my voice um, uh, to make sure that the audience was engaged. Um, so I think you have to, to think a little bit about that more and maybe think about the visuals a little bit differently too. So you wanna make sure, like I noticed when, um, when, like the, when you were sharing the slide screen, for example, that it appears really differently than when it's projected on a, on a slide in a, in a classroom, like, I mean, or like in a, in a room. So like thinking about how like the colors look differently and like how big the text is gonna look. Um, in an online format versus um, in person could be important. Do you have any tips to avoid sounding unprofessional during the presentation? 
Um, is there a phrase or a word choice you should never use during your presentation? I mean, I don't know. I think what's interesting about the, the lightning talk is that it, it is a little bit more casual. Like you can, t you, you're talking about things in, um, in a more, in a more casual way, but that doesn't mean it's not professional. Like it's still about research. Um, so it is sort of like this fine line. So I, I so I mean, I, I guess maybe if there's like anything inappropriate or anything that may offend an audience member, you probably don't want to use in the presentation. But I mean, just to like give Jamal's talk as an example, like Jamal was talking about um, Viagra, which is something, but he did it in like a really professional way. And um, we knew like what he was talking about, the jokes were really well placed. And I think that like, that's a perfect example of how you can talk about something that's relatable. And it's still like, super, super um, professional. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to highlight that it was great. Great talk. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I think uh, you said it nearly perfectly. I think the only thing that I have to add is uh, try to try to avoid saying um, uh, hmm, any of those like filler words that we tend to say when we're trying to think of something, um, which is difficult and something you need to become aware of um, that I still struggle with. <laughs> um, but especially like this is where the when we had said practice, this is where the practice comes in because the more you practice, the less likely it is that you're going to say uh, or. Anything. The next uh, question is. Um... My biggest struggle during any kind of speech involves rolling with the punches. How do you get back into the flow of your speech when you mess up? I think this is a great question. Um, I think there's multiple approaches. Um, I think one of the things is, uh, one I think one method I could say is that you know your research pretty well and if you know your story that you're kind of going with, even if you get sidetracked off your story, you kind of know the general path to kind of get back in it, even if you have to use completely different language than you were used to. And that's totally okay. Um, the other thing that I have seen work before is if you just take an extra second and breathe, uh, sometimes that'll help. Of course, you want to be careful of it not staying like an awkward pause where we just all watch you for 30 seconds. Um, but that's where if you know your, if you kind of know the story that you want to tell, you can, you might be able to find a way to weave your way back into it. You've both talked about memorization techniques that helped you with your talk. Could you, or rather, you've both mentioned that. What were some of your memorization techniques? Bailey, we'll start with you. Sure, yeah. So um, I think one technique is to break the speech down into smaller components and then try to memorize each piece. Um, I have a bunch of strategies. The other is to like, write it over and over again um like i had to do this like for vocabulary in like elementary school like you just had to write the word over and over again until you spelled it correctly and it kind of works with the speech sometimes too it gets in your head and another like more modern technology is to like record yourself saying it and then just listen to it as you're going about like as you whatever piece of music you would listen to just like put it on repeat and just listen to it it helps you find like areas where you're talking too fast or talking too slowly but once you have a good version down it's like you know it gets like in your head in a good way i was like if you had any more i was like those are the technique that i used so the recording one is really is a good one it's jarring because you have to listen to yourself yeah. but it's a good yeah. technique <laughs> So we've talked about, um, for example, memorization and practice as ways to deal with the nerves. What do you do right before you have to do a talk? Um, I myself, I make sure, I've, now that I've lived a significant amount of life, um, I tend to recognize what my triggers tend to be. So for example, one of my triggers is I can't really eat too close to the talk. Um, otherwise my stomach just starts to gurgle um, I just feel uncomfortable. I start to get sweaty, all of these things. So that was something that I was able to like know that a couple hours before my talk, I just should not really ingest anything but water. Um, and it, uh, it's kind of, and I would really recommend any sort of like, like breathing technique if you can find one, whether that be something as simple, like breathing your own nose and out your mouth, whether that be closing your eyes, whether that be, I have a playlist on Spotify that I call my height playlist. So whenever I feel super nervous, I will just put those in and I will just like blast my EDM songs to myself and I'll be like, okay, this is slightly distracting me, but also helping me kind of focus on one thing so that I'm not just going all over the place. 
Yeah. Um, I was going to definitely say the hype stuff. Like, I, like, definitely hype myself up. But, I like, so not, like, sometimes with music, but then also with, like, telling myself, like, you've accomplished other things. You've done this before. Like, you're great. Like, just, like, giving myself all the encouragement. Um, and I feel like I hype myself up that way. Uh, and then also just putting it into perspective. Like usually, unless it's a job talk, which is not what we're talking about, it's like, you know, like this, it's, it's, it's a learning experience. It's a learning process. And you, you're supposed to learn more about yourself through it. So don't make yourself think get, that you get so nervous um, and you think about that it's more than what it is. It's important and you should take it seriously. But I would say that you also want to keep it in perspective. And so I think I do a mixture of both encouraging myself but then keeping it in perspective too thanks um we're going to return to the question of digital presentations and the, the next question adds a dimension to that um which is um how do you make sure that you're still being engaging without getting any feedback from the audience and this is a question i'd like to know how to answer because sometimes i want to insert jokes to these talks and but i can't hear if they're working so i i, I avoid them yeah this was hard. I mean, it was really hard not to see anybody's like face while I was presenting. Um, because like, even though I try not to make too much eye contact because I get nervous, like I would have liked to see people's faces because some, some people nod in the audience, like, and, um, and I like that. Um, so I would say like, in a way, it, you just stay focused on your talk and like you've practiced it enough, like with other people who told you it's interesting. So I think you focus and like generate images of those people reminding you that it's a good talk to keep your audience engaged. Um, but you know, maybe you do have to do more in terms of, like the pausing or interjecting like funny stories to keep the audience engaged. But at the same time, it's only three minutes. So I think like, you, the audience's attention span should be three minutes. So I think. Yeah, I think I agree with, I agree with all of that. Um, and it's, I think the one good, one good, uh, it's also how you view it, I think. You could see it as from a different viewpoint that it's an advantage where you might say a joke or something like that. But you can't see the audience nodding or you can't hear them laughing and you might think the joke is funny and you, stop for them to laugh but you don't hear anything so you're like okay well i don't know if the joke was funny or not but it was funny to me so i can keep going um so i'd say maybe take a different try to approach it from a different mindset rather than the negative mindset more the i get to use this to my advantage and maybe like you might view it as less to lose <laughs> the next question returns us to this um to the challenge of you know conveying data and conveying specificity um, which is something we all aspire to as researchers. Um, the student who's asking this is giving in reference to the pandemic, but saying one of the biggest struggles I'm having with my presentation is data. Due to the pandemic, the collection of data has been impossible for the research team. Facing this, how would you deal with a presentation without data from your investigation? Now, you both mentioned that sometimes you don't necessarily want to drill too far down. Um, how would you approach that problem? Because in your cases, you've already done the research, right? You, you, you actually sort of know what the figures are. How would you approach this problem with a little bit more uncertainty about what the data would be um, if, you, if you had been able to gather it? I think this presents an exciting opportunity in itself, um, which is kind of, you can ask yourself, well, why are you approaching this project? And you can focus a bit more on the why, and you can focus, like, why is it necessary? Why do we want to, why do we, why are we interested in this? Uh, what could it potentially change? If, and not like trying to avoid all data, but you could potentially use past data if there is any. But assuming there isn't, why are you approaching the project? What do you want to change? And then what do you think the results could be? And you'd be surprised at how much time all of those actually take up in themselves. Um, kind of like presenting the problem, how you think you're going to address it could easily, easily be three minutes. Um, but you want to figure out a way to get people excited about the data that you're going to collect. So it's essentially being like, I think this data is going to be awesome. Here's why. Um, and here's what I've read that kind of led up to this. Yeah, um, I think going off of that too, like you can sort of keep it preliminary. So often if you don't have the data, you have like hypotheses about it and expectations. And so you can sort of present it like a, in a more future oriented way um, to, to, to talk about it. Jamal, you mentioned earlier um, 
and you had to work on fast talking. Um, what advice do you have for slowing down the pace of the talk? Oh, okay. There's many things that could be said here. Um, one of the things is you could see kind of if you outlined your talk in your head, kind of where you minute wise, where you would want everything to fall. Another thing that would help you slow down is enunciating your words. Like when you are practicing, make sure that you are truly enunciating your words and you will be surprised at how, off, how much that will slow you down. Um, the other thing that goes for just also staying calm is don't forget to breathe. Oftentimes you'll just keep talking faster and faster and then you'll realize you haven't taken a breath in like 40 seconds. And then when you take a breath, it sounds like you just like lifted your head out of a swimming pool. Um, so mm -hmm. kind of like doing little things like that what are definitely good at helping. And then I think the last thing I'd like to add is if you um, record yourself, um, you can kind of tell that um, you are going fast. Or like, I, I know that I have talked to friends before, I still struggle with speaking fast, but I've talked to friends who say, you are just going through this like a train, you need to figure out a way to slow it down somehow. And then I force myself to start talking at slower speeds. So if you if you know that you are a fast talker, when you first time yourself, maybe if you know that nerves are going to happen, time it closer so that you hit three minutes. So then on the day of, you're actually at 2.45 and you're like, well, that's okay. I'm still under time and I'm great. Bailey, how do you manage pace? Uh, I think I talk kind of slow. Um, so, uh, so I sometimes I have to like speed up a little bit, but I, I use pretty much the same method. Um, that Jamal uses like I, I think it's really important to record yourself as like annoying as it's, it is to watch it um, I think like recording it like you can use QuickTime that's usually that's on a lot of computers and you can record your screen and record your voice um, you can also record so you can see yourself speaking um, and I think that relates a lot to like the body language question too um, which I might just pull like pull in there like the next question that Edwin asked about like um, when you're sitting in front of a screen, you have to like, there's sort of different body language that you want to use versus when you're giving a presentation. So like, I think when you're giving a presentation, like going like this and like pointing different things makes sense. But like, if I'm doing this on the Zoom call, it's like, like confusing and it's like, what's going on? So if you struggle with the body language piece, like you can put something in your hand um, so that you, you aren't, if you speak a lot, sometimes people speak with their hands a lot. So if you tend to do that and you don't want to do that during your talk, you can just hold something. And like when you get nervous, you can move it and you, no one can sort of, um, will be able to see what, what's happening. So I think that's one, um, one way. Um, and to just sort of preview what you look like beforehand as best you can. We're just about at time, so we've got time for one last question. And um, I'm actually going to throw in my answer to this question as well, but then I'm going to pose it to you. So the next question is, what do you do if someone asks you a question and you don't really know the answer? My answer is, you say, that's a great question. You write the question down. You say, I can't wait to dig into it. Um, and then you can move on. Um, but uh, Jamal, Bailey, what are your thoughts on responding to when you don't know the answer. Uh, that's a perfect, I think, way to go about it. Um, the other strategy is to like, sometimes there's like one small piece of the question you can answer and you just focus on that. And one thing you don't do is you never ask, did I answer your question? If it's like a really, like really serious talk and then you, then this it was advice given to me like, um, on the job market more is like, because then it gives someone an opportunity to say like, no, you didn't answer my question and I want you to talk about this more and then you're kind of like stuck. So I would say just kind of like take it, answer what you can and say like the second part of that question, I think is great for future research. Yeah, I agree. Alluding to future research, things you can do with it, uh, telling them that it's a great question. These are all good things. Um, don't, I don't make anything up. If you are about to say something, admit that you are completely hypothesizing on the spot. Um, so yeah, do, do not lie. Do not say that you're an expert. Like say, if you had to come up with something, if, they, if you get really getting pressured, if I had to make an educated guess, here is why I'm making the educated guess based on this information. Um, if not, it's okay to admit that you might not know an answer, but you would be willing to look into it. You'd be able to follow up with them. There's so many things you can answer that.
I just don't lie. Well, this has been phenomenal. Um, it, you know, it, it, the hour has felt like it's gone by in just three minutes because I, I feel oh. like I've learned so much. I hope everybody else has at home. Um, I can clearly see why you both uh, deserved the awards that you won. Um, uh, I imagine you'll be winning many more accolades, um, both for your public speaking ability and for your research moving forward. Um, to, this, to the viewers at home, if you have any other questions, please post them in the Google Classroom or send them to one of our team and we'll make sure that we get them to our wonderful panelists. Please give a loud round of applause at home. I want them to be able to hear you from where they are. Um, I'm gonna give one that you can hear. Um, that's all we have for today. Thank you both again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your great questions. Yeah, thank you. These are a lot of fun to answer and thank you for having